All right, so this session is going to be recorded. Um, so if anybody does not wish to be recorded, you can turn out your video at any time. Um, but we do highly encourage you to turn on your video um, because this is an interactive discussion. We wanna make sure that uh, you know we're feeling like a community. So um, if you can turn on your video and you're comfortable doing so, go ahead and do it. Um, I'm going to uh, kick it over to Dara Purvis, um, who is going to introduce our very, very special guest speaker um, this evening, Congresswoman Schakowsky. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Dara Purvis. I'm a professor at Penn State Law and a member of the Board of Directors of the Population Connection and Population Connection Action Fund. I'm so thrilled to get the chance to, to introduce uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky to you, um, although I, I doubt she needs much, much introduction. Um, she represents Illinois' ninth congressional district. Um, she's uh, uh, represented that district for 12 terms. Uh, she serves in House Democratic leadership. She's, she is the senior chief deputy whip, serves on a number of extremely important uh, committees. But from my perspective, at least, and I think from, from many of our perspectives, we appreciate her long advocacy and commitment to women's issues um, in Congress, particularly the fight to protect reproductive freedom. Um, so she has a, a long history of really being on the front line of the issue. She is an original co-sponsor of the Global Her Act. She is the lead sponsor of the Abortion is Healthcare Everywhere Act. Uh, which was introduced in the House last week on International Women's Day. Um, so I am just thrilled to hear from her. It's a, a great honor. And uh, uh, Congresswoman, the floor is yours. Congresswoman Schakowsky, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Thanks, Dara, and I'm so happy to be with all of you. What a great gathering you have. I know you have a wonderful panel that's going to be coming up, um, and I am just thrilled to be able to talk with all of you. Um, so I do go way back. I go way back before Roe v. Wade. I'm from Chicago, and one of the things that happened in Chicago uh, was Jane. It was a, really an underground network of women, run by women, um, to find safe abortions for women, even when abortion was illegal. That doesn't mean though that I didn't have friends who risked their lives quite literally. And I like to say that Roe wasn't the beginning of women having abortions. It was the end of women dying from abortions. Um, and so um, that's my beginning. Um, fighting for, uh, for, for Roe and, and finally winning that, but it didn't take long um, before the uh, antis began their attacks. And so the Hyde Amendment um, came shortly after um, uh, preventing uh, any public dollars whatsoever, any federal dollars um, from, being for, from abortion services. Um, and now we have the Each Woman Act that uh, Barbara Lee and I introduced a number of years ago to just get rid of the Hyde Amendment once and for all. And of course, we're, we also have a promise that it will not appear in the appropriations bill. The chairman of the appropriations bill, uh, Rosa DeLauro said, no, we're done with having Hyde in the, in, in, there. And, and then, of course, um, there was the Helms Amendment. And I don't know, I, somehow it is as important um, as, uh, as other bills, but um, I didn't really know about it until fairly recently. The Helms Amendment, Jesse Helms, a, uh, a, a racist, and of course he was happy to deprive um, countries with women of color in particular, from having federal funding that would come from the foreign affairs uh, money could not go, it, first it said, to uh, any country that would use abortion as um, family planning. But then it morphed into any country that would do abortion for any reason. 
And, and so um, I uh, have uh, introduced abortion is healthcare everywhere. I like the name of that bill because I like having the, the word abortion in it because we are standing tall and proud and strong. And then of course, there's the global gag rule. Uh, so, so we want to repeal the, uh, the, the Helms Amendment, but the global gag rule, you know, it's history. There's a Republican president and they impose a global gag rule on any organization, any NGO, even with their own money that would dare to have abortions um, over anywhere outside the country. I mean, really. And then we get a Democratic president like we have now, who on, I think it was the first or second day, said, no way, we're going to get rid of the global gag rule. Well, now we have the Global Her Act that we need to pass that says, we're not going to fight that fight anymore. We're just going to get rid of the global gag rule altogether. So we're... Um, you know, we're, we're moving along on, the, on this agenda. So I wanna tell you, I think in some ways, this moment in history is both the best of times and the worst of times. And I wanna talk about the best of time, be optimistic first. Women are mobilized more than I have ever seen and fierce, I love it. Um, and we are, um, a pro-choice nation. Yes, we are. The majority of Americans believe that women should have, that it should not be for politicians to decide. It should be for women to decide. Now there are levels of, you know, support for uh, abortion, of course, with all kinds of exceptions in some places. But in general, we have a pro choice country and we definitely have a pro-choice house of representatives and that's why these bills are going to pass and then they're going to go to the the senate and then we have to deal with the filibuster um, and here's the worst of times we have um, a supreme court that is six to three anti anti-choice um, three appointed by, uh, by, by Donald Trump. But I wanna tell you something and I'm gonna um, perhaps end with this. You're gonna have to you know, do something to tell me when to, when to quit here. Women are not gonna go back. I wanna say to you, my sisters, I don't know what exactly that's gonna look like, but we are simply not gonna go back. Um, I think that we will have um, OBGYNs who are going to say they're not going to start serving their patients. I think we are going to have demonstrations like you've never seen before if they were to dare to repeal Roe v. Wade. And by the way, there's a, a new bill that uh, has passed in Arkansas, hasn't gone into effect yet, that would essentially and abortions. And I think what the antis want is that for that bill to go to the, the Supreme Court. Um, and so we have to be geared up to do whatever we need to do to create an environment that we can live in that is safe and that will deal with our reproductive health. Um, I also just wanted to um, highlight um, it, again, I want you to cut me off when you, you need me to. I, I believe in discipline here for meetings like this. I just wanted to tell you the legislative principles for the pro-choice caucus that we have, which is one of the biggest caucuses that we have in our um, Democratic House of Representatives, passing clean funding bills free from any and all harmful anti-choice riders anywhere to make sure that that doesn't happen, to increase funding for critical domestic and global um, programs, uh, including Title X and uh, teen pregnancy, et cetera, um, 
and, um, and of course, internationally. And then three, eliminating funds for um, abstinence only uh, education and, uh, and, sec and sexual risk of avoidance uh, programs. So we also have 16 bills. I mentioned some of them that are on our agenda that the Pro-Choice Caucus is going to, um, I'm one of the leaders of, is going to, uh, to, to be pursuing. Um, so really the, the, the only, the last thing I wanna say is states. We have to watch what's going on in states because um, too many of these states are dominated by Republicans and they are doing everything they can to make our reproductive health, to punish Planned Parenthood, to punish any of your organizations and the, and the work that, uh, that, that you're doing. So um, we need to be partners every step of the way. We need an inside strategy. That's the pro-choice caucus in the house and an, out, <coughs> excuse me, an outside strategy. That is you and all of the organizations that are fighting for reproductive health. We need to be coordinated. We need to plan our activities together um, to make sure that the timing works and that the language works we don't never want to introduce anything that, you know, you, you say, oh, I wish it would have said this or that. We have to be together as close as we can be. So I just thank you for your advocacy, for your, uh, for your research. I know that uh, Gutheimer has provided all kinds of information, has told me that if we do the Helms Amendment will prevent 42 million um, unsafe abortions um, will prevent them and that we will save thousands of, of lives. Guttmacher, thank you. I know that we've got uh, IPAS on your uh, panel. Uh, we have the Center for um, Health Health and, uh, and, and Gender Equity. I wish I could stay. I have to go um, vote, but I just send you my love I wanna send you as much strength as all of us have together and that is plenty to do the job. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, so Congresswoman, thank you for joining us. Um, I know you do have to go vote. Do you have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions or do you need to run? Do I have time for a couple of questions? Yes, I think- Okay, I wonderful. Um, so we would love to know what what are your what are the prospects for the Global Her Act this year? We know like this is the year to get this done. Like what are the prospects for getting it done, and what can our participants here do to help push this piece of legislation through? Okay, you have to target members of the Senate in particular, and and I'm sure we will also produce a list. There may be some in the House that need to be bolstered and need to hear from you. So that's the, the, the main thing. And the message to the members, senators or house members needs to come from the district. So we need to be mobilized ar ar around their districts. The second thing is for many of the bills that we are passing now that are, um, not done with reconciliation where we only need 50 votes, we're going to have to do something um, about the filibuster, about the requirement, the undemocratic requirement for 60 votes. I mean, think about it. The Senate itself is not especially democratic when you know California and Utah each have two senators and then you add insult to injury with requiring 60 votes. So we, we're gonna have to do something and I'm encouraged because we've heard um, both from um, the, the president and we've heard um, from senators that there's you know some movement in that direction. But um, you need to think about mobilizing your members collectively in all of the states so that members of Senate and the House hear from their own 
people. Those are the important things to do. I, how long? Oh, I've got one minute. Okay. Well, we won't, we will let you go. We don't want to make you have to jog down to the floor. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I know this was a tremendous honor for all of our constituents and people here to hear from you. Uh, we appreciate all the work that you've done over the years and we look forward to continuing to, to work with you on. Thank the you so much. I send you love and strength. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Good night. Okay. Let's see how I, I'll let somebody else get me off. <laughs> can do that. Yes, I see a sign here. I can get off. Awesome. I want to hear in the chat, what did you all think of Congresswoman Schakowsky? Tell us some of your thoughts. We are so happy to have such an awesome champion um, working on our issues. Um, obviously, the Congresswoman's a busy person, so um, she had to start right at the start. Um, so I wanted to take a little moment now to kind of reset um, and uh, set some, give you all some more information about tonight's event. Um, so uh, my name is Lindsay Apperson. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the National Field Manager of Population Connection and Population Connection Action Fund. Um, and we're really excited to have you here today for our 2021 Digital Capital Hill Days keynote event. Um, you just heard from uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky, um, and we're also going to hear from some other really incredible speakers tonight for our panel discussion, including uh, Maria Antoinetta Alcalde Castro, who is the director of IPAS Central America and Mexico, Zara Ahmed, who is the associate director of federal issues at the Guttmacher Institute, and Sarah Sippel, who is the president of Center for Health and Gender Equity. So um, we're really excited to um, enjoy this panel with you all. Um, I'm loving all of the excitement in the chat tonight. Um, before we jump into our conversation, I also want to cover a few housekeeping items. Um, please keep yourself muted while the speakers are talking to avoid any audio interference. And then you can feel free to drop questions in the chat for our speakers. We're going to be covering those questions at the end. We've also taken steps to make sure that this is a safe space, but there's always a chance that we could have online trolls who try to interfere with the event. Um, if that happens, we'll pause the discussion. I'll put up an image on my screen until that person has been removed, and then we'll start back up with our discussion. Um, so now I wanna kick it over to uh, Dara Purvis, who is um, our, on our board of directors of both uh, Population Connection and Population Connection Action Fund, who um, is gonna start off with a couple words before we kick it off to um, our panel discussion. Hello, so I don't know if it's easier if you were thinking a Q&A or I can just talk about abortion rights, which I'm very, very happy to do. <laughs> Um, Talk about abortion rights. That's what we're here for. <laughs> right. So I gave myself a very, very quick introduction if you were here right at the beginning because I, I knew Congresswoman Schakowsky was in a rush. So again, I uh, am Dar Purvis, uh, pronouns are she, her. I'm a professor at Penn State Law and I specialize in gender and sexuality in the law, reproductive rights, assisted reproductive technologies, um, and a lot of things in that space. And so I can talk for, for a few minutes about sort of the state, uh, Co Congresswoman Schakowsky referred to sort of the threat before the Supreme Court right now uh, to abortion rights and reproductive rights more generally. So I thought I could talk for just a few minutes about uh, sort of where we stand before the court. And I will preface my remarks by, by saying that I am a lawyer, so I am obliged to be cynical and pessimistic. So I apologize for what will probably sound a little bit negative, but I am very concerned uh, with what is going to happen before the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, uh, all of you are very engaged in this issue, so you may be uh, pretty familiar with kind of the lay of the legal land, um, but to kind of remind you of where things stand. Um, Roe v. Wade established clearly the right to abortion as the right to privacy as a constitutional right uh, in 1973. But basically since then, it's been under attack from a variety of theories and with a variety of techniques. 
And in particular, we've seen the membership of the Supreme Court shift considerably um, uh, towards a much more anti-abortion perspective. Um, so Roe v. Wade set out what, what is no longer used but was a trimester framework of understanding abortion rights, where in the first trimester, the pregnant person had you know, pretty complete control about whether to, to terminate the pregnancy or not. Second trimester sort of balanced the rights between the pregnant person and the state's perceived interest in, in unborn life. And then in the third trimester, that state interest kind of took over. Um, that shifted considerably. The test changed entirely in Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania v. Casey in the 90s, which very nearly overturned Roe v. Wade. Um, we now know from some of the justices' papers that were released um, years after the case that the initial vote was to overturn Roe v. Wade. But some centrist justices sort of came to a, a compromise um, to at least keep the core of the abortion right stable, but they created what's known as the undue burden test. So if a regulation or a limitation on access to abortion creates an undue burden, in, in a person's ability to choose to terminate their pregnancy that violates the constitution. Otherwise, it's an appropriate expression of, of the state's preference, which, which they held the state can express against abortion and in favor of what the state views as unborn life. Now, what that did was it kind of opened the floodgates to a lot of smaller restrictions in the first trimester that never would have been allowed under the initial Roe v. Wade framework. Um, so, so the one common approach became what's known as TRAP, Targeted Restrictions of Abortion Providers. So it's restrictions that on their face um, don't seem particularly significant. They may not um, immediately appear to be a really direct attack on the abortion right. So it'll be something like, uh, we want abortion clinics to follow the same kind of building code requirements as ambulatory surgical centers. So you might not read that language uh, and think to yourself, this is really an attack on the core abortion right. But what that would do is require every clinic that provides abortions to um, basically redesign uh, the entire building meet some very burdensome requirements that all sorts of other medical facilities that perform procedures much more dangerous than abortions um, with higher risk to health and to life that they don't have to meet. And the idea is this is going to make it harder for clinics to provide abortion care. This is going to make it harder for women to access abortions, um, for people to access abortions. Um, so there has been a sort of slow inching, um, narrower and narrower towards people's realistic ability uh, to access abortion care. Um, and one of the, the most recent cases, uh, Whole Woman's Health from just a few years ago, was really kind of one of the first um, uh, uh, rejections of these trap restrictions. Um, so this was the, the statute in Texas that Wendy Davis famously filibustered for hours on the state floor. Uh, it had a couple of requirements, the ambulatory surgical center requirement that I mentioned, and then it required that any doctor performing abortions have admitting privileges at a hospital, which can be very difficult uh, to obtain because abortions are so safe that you very rarely need to interact with the hospital at all. And typically there's a requirement that you admit a certain number of patients each year to have these kinds of requirements. And for the first time, the Supreme Court said, when we are assessing whether something is an undue burden, we're going to ask whether it benefits people seeking abortion. Because previously they had just said, is this a strong enough, you know, is this a high enough burden placed on someone seeking an abortion? Um, so once they said, will this actually benefit the patients, the, the people going for abortion care, they said they, the answer to that is clearly no. There's no evidence that these measures will do anything to provide better medical care for people. It will shut down most clinics in Texas, um, and it will make it much harder for people to safely seek abortion care.
So this was a little bit of a watershed. This was very promising. Um, but then, uh, as all of us know, uh, Justice Ginsburg passed away and left the court. Um, and we are faced with a bench that looks pretty strongly anti-abortion. Um, so there, there was one case last fall, June Medical, or last summer, I should say, June Medical Services, um, where unusually Chief Justice Roberts crossed the aisle and voted with the justices who we would think of as more progressive uh, to strike down um, an abortion restriction. But it was an unusual decision because the restriction in question was exactly the same restriction that the court had already struck down in Whole Woman's Health. And so Chief Justice Roberts wrote a concurrence, but it's basically the, it has the power of the opinion of the court um, to say, I'm striking this down because no one raised the underlying constitutional question of whether there is a right to abortion under the constitution. And because no one has asked that, I'm bound to follow our previous precedent. Um, and that precedent is clear. But hey, if anyone were to bring a case before the court that actually said Roe v. Wade should be overturned, that would be an entirely different question. And right now in state legislatures throughout the country and in lower courts throughout the country, you have people and advocates trying to get that case before the court. Um, so Congresswoman Schakowsky mentioned uh, a bill in Arkansas uh, that virtually outlaws abortion in all circumstances, um, that it's hard to see it as anything but uh, a frontal assault on the right to abortion and Roe v. Wade. Um, so it's my prediction that we're going to see a case that explicitly asks the court to overturn Roe v. Wade in the next term, um, maybe in the next two terms. And the, the prospect for that case does not look good given the membership of the court as it stands today. So it's, it's more important than ever, even though we have these exciting um, opportunities for legislative action, it's more important than ever that we be prepared for what's coming because we may be in a situation where, where we're you know, seeing the legal groundwork that we've had for decades. Um, potentially taken away from us. And the legislative and the popular action is going to be more important than ever. When oh, I'm looking in the chat, <laughs> so I'm not good at talking and reading at the same time. <laughs> um, one question, uh, do you think there's any hope for changing people's views on abortion, therefore increasing the likelihood of pro-abortion laws? I do. Um, I've seen this just in, in the students who I have, who, who I've talked about abortion with. So one of the statistics that I don't think people are aware of, and like I've seen it change the mind of my students in front of me, is that the majority of people seeking abortions already have children. Um, these are people, you know, deciding how to best form and support their, their family. Um, I think there's a lot of mischaracterization and um, kind of demonization of people who seek abortion care in a way that doesn't reflect, you know, who these people are. You know, these, these are people that you know already and they're making decisions for, for very understandable reasons. Um, and surprisingly, I, I, despite a lot of work to try to raise that awareness, um, somehow I think it just hasn't taken hold in the way that I think it should. Um, because I, I've seen that be very persuasive for people, sort of realizing that their picture of who seeks abortion care, um, it just doesn't correspond with reality. Thank you so much, Dara. We really appreciate your time um, and that really wonderful grounding reminder of the moment that we're in with the courts um, and our own fight for to expand access to abortion care. Um, I think especially as we talk about policies like the global gag rule and the Helms Amendment, it's really important to remember that all of these attacks are stemming from the same exact place. Um, I'm going to now kick it over to uh, Stacey Murphy, who's our Director of Congressional Relations, who will be moderating today's panel.
Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be moderating the panel. As Lindsay mentioned, my name is Stacy Murphy. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Congressional Relations for Population Connection and Population Connection Action Fund. Um, I'm going to invite uh, our panelists to be pinned up here along with me so we can all be looking at each other. There's Sarah. Zara and Maria. Okay, um, so I'm going to let all of them introduce themselves and, and just part of the first question, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about your organization and the work that you do, and then in keeping with the title of this session, tell me what is your vision for bold international reproductive health policy under the Biden administration? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll, I can go first, Stacey. Um, I'm, you know, with a Z name, I always have to go at the end. So I will take my Let's flip it up. go first this time. So hi, everybody. I'm Zara Ahmed. I use she, her pronouns, and I lead U.S. foreign assistance and foreign policy work for the Guttmacher Institute. Um, the Guttmacher Institute is a research and advocacy organization that focuses on sexual and reproductive health and rights at the international, federal, and state levels. So I put out a piece last month that lays out our vision for sexual and reproductive health, and it's namely a world where everyone has access to the full suite of sexual and reproductive health and rights. The piece also talks about how the U.S. should contribute, and it's a complex piece, but at the bottom, uh, the bottom line is that the Biden-Harris team needs to take four key actions. First, re-engage and lead on the world stage, and they've started doing that. Second, move the U.S. towards paying its fair share for global health. Third, address outdated and, outdated and coercive policies, chief among them being the global gag rule and the Helms Amendment. And lastly, rebuilding the technical, programmatic, and diplomatic capacity of the U.S. government. I'll stop there, but just want to say how happy I am to be here this evening with you all. So our alphabetically is your turn, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. Um, so glad to be here. Um, I'm Sarah Seppel. I'm president of Change, uh, the Center for Health and Gender Equity, and uh, we are here in Washington D.C. And we were um, we were founded in 1994 uh, to hold the U.S. government accountable to the commitments it made at the 1994 International Conference on Population Development. Um, so we are here in Washington, D.C., our mandate, our responding to the call from our global partners um, after ICPD to go home, take care of our own government. <laughs> and so we take that to heart. And so that's why we're here um, to really uh, push the U.S. government to, um, to, to fulfill its commitment to the global agenda uh, to promote universal access to um, sexual reproductive health and rights. And just um, some exciting things, I think, in terms of when we're thinking about bold action from the US government, uh, we've already seen within the first 50 days of this administration, um, two executive actions, a presidential memorandum and an executive order that states that it is US policy to support sexual and reproductive health and rights in the US and globally. Um, this has been a long-term goal of change in many advocates, so um, and it's historic and unprecedented. And then I also want to note the U.S. delegation to the, the U.N. Commission on the Status of Women this week, um, a historic delegation that really is demonstrating the, this administration's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it was the first time the U.S. was represented at the White House level at the CSW, and the first time two women of color co-led that delegation. And the diversity of the members of the delegation itself um, really show the administration is taking an intersectional approach to gender equality with the inclusion of a non-binary transgender woman, Lourdes Ashley Hunter, as a member of the official U.S. delegation. So I just kind of like wanted to flag those two um, really important benchmarks and say that the, the government, this administration is off to a good start. It's just a start, has a long way to go to be taking bold action, but I think it's really a call for us on advocates to, to 
push them. Um, they've signaled they're they're ready for bold action. So, just to, and just in conclusion, um, what would bold reproductive sexual reproductive rights agenda of this administration look like? I think it would be one that really uh, you know adopts a reproductive justice framework. So that would be that all policies and programs protect and promote bodily autonomy. Takes an intersectional approach. Centers the lives of those who are most impacted by U.S. policies and dismantles the racist and neo-colonial policy structures and systems of our US foreign assistance. So, um, so I have I have big uh, I, plans, vision for this administration. I don't know if we'll get it done in four years, but I think we're off to a good start. And I'm delighted to be here because we need all of you to help us make that a reality. So thank you. Great, it's hard to go after Sarah and, and Sarah. Uh, I'm Maria Antonieta Alcalde Castro. I'm director of IPAS for Central America and Mexico. I'm here all on behalf of Anu Kumar, who's the director of IPAS, but couldn't make it uh, due to a conflict in her schedule. Uh, but I'm really, really glad and happy to be here. IPAS is an international nonprofit organization. We work across Africa, Asia, and Latin America to improve access to abortion and contraception so that everyone can determine their own future. We know that like this is a fundamental right and that when women can actually decide over, when we, when we can decide over our sexuality, uh, the, the whole community benefits. Uh, we believe that abortion is health care. We believe, we, we are convinced that it shouldn't be, like it, it's like an imposed agenda that, that, that is this controversial when it's a health care service that is like actually um, non-dangerous for women that you can actually have in your own place. Um, so like that this whole rhetoric about making it very controversial, it's, it's part of a, of another agenda that doesn't have uh, women at the center of it. Um, we have very high hopes uh, as, as Sarah and, and Sarah were, were talking. I think that the entire world is looking at the Biden-Harris administration right now after the, I mean, the, the past four years with the, with the Trump administration, of course, were um, had a huge impact in the US, but it also had a huge impact worldwide. Uh, when it comes to women's rights, and, and Sarah was, was mentioning the Commission on the Status of Women at the UN, and I had the opportunity to work very closely at and, and many UN negotiations, and the impact of the US policy was huge. We have never seen something like that. Like, I mean, the US coming very strongly, like harassing, bullying other countries to join their agenda. Like, I mean, really like a, like trying to please the most conservative groups with like things that were nonsense. This idea of like, for example, a pick and choosing human rights, saying these are real human rights, these are not human rights, things that we have not seen. And it, things that were embarrassing for the US people who had fought so hard for a human rights agenda, like with every administration, like, I mean, you can have like, but we have never seen anything that like what we saw with the Trump administration. So I think that the entire world is looking right now at the Biden and Harris administration say, you have a long way to go just to get things right. I mean, just to get to the point where we were four years ago, but we have further expectations in terms of really putting women in the center of your agenda. Um, and, and I think that like uh, we're seeing good signs, but the, there is a long way. And we, we, we think that it's important to start as, as fast as possible and as hard as possible. So I would stop. We could all go on for a while with what we would like to see over the next few years. So let's talk about specifically the global gag rule and how your organization or how your work was impacted by the Trump reinstatement and expansion of the global gag rule. Uh, where there were impacts, are those ongoing, even though we've seen the rule rescinded? And in your opinion, like how long is it going to take to actually get those impacts going the other direction? Can start now so we can go the other way. Uh, uh, I mean, from my experience working internationally in reproductive health and reproductive justice for many years, really the, gov the global gag rule had tremendous impact. I mean, the, the US is a big player on the sexual and reproductive health field. 
and it really affects a lot of communities. And and I mean, as you know, uh, the global tax rule. I think that it's um, it's clearly a very ineffective policy, even for people who cares about the reduction of abortion services. It has been proven that uh, that it's it's not effective to reduce the need of an abortion. And I think that um, a Congresswoman Chikowski was already saying, like this discussion. I mean, like these type of policies are not about like abortion, yes or not. It's about making abortion safe or unsafe because women are a, will need these services regardless. So first, I think that what we have seen, it's very ineffective. It has put in women in, in a very challenging situation where like their own provider cannot really provide them with a comprehensive uh, and service that they need, like in, in many places. And I think that like, that's why the name, the global gag rule, because it had really gagged organizations and service providers and had put it like, service providers in a very difficult positions where they have to decide between giving the the information and the services that their patient needs or keeping their doors open so it's like it's really unfair so it's and at the same time it's ineffective because we know that it doesn't reduce the need of abortion we know that the only thing that renews or the few things that are renewed that the needs of abortion is access to contraceptives comprehensive sexuality education and improve the conditions of women where maternity is not a, a, a kind of a, a something that hinders the possibility of women to develop. I mean, those are the real things. Like, like I always said, like if you care to reduce the, the need of abortion, invest in family planning, uh, like access to contraceptions, comprehensive sexuality education, and like a, an, an ensuring that maternity and, and motherhood is not hindered like the possibilities of women to develop. So we know that. We know that it is an very imperialistic um, a policy and, and very disrespectful to national laws because basically what it says is, regardless of like if you actually have the right to, to, to abortion services in your country, in your own context, I will impose my own view. So women that actually have the right to access abortion in their own countries, in their own communities, are denied of those informations because this country in the North is imposing its view. So it's very colonialistic, very imperialistic. And most of all, it's a very cruel policy because it's like making, it's impacting the most vulnerable women, the women that are served by 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 these organizations are the ones the most in need. A woman, a wealthy woman in in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in Mexico, can fly to the U.S. and have access to one to to I mean to a safe and legal abortion, or pay their own physician in in their own countries and have access. Are the the women living in rural communities? The women like like uh, the the women who are indigenous women, the ones that are affected. So what we have seen, it's it's very as I said inefficient, imperialistic, and cruel. And the challenge is that people, organizations are in fear. And I mean, of course they need the resources to, to provide the services they need. So many times, like what, it's what it has been challenging between this, uh, repealing the GAC rule and they're imposing the GAC rule and with every change in the in the government in the US is that at the end, it creates this stigma around abortion that, that that it's very dangerous and and like kind of like uh, prevent again physicians and organizations like this fear to work on an area where we know that abortion it's health care it's just a service that many an amazing number of women need during the reproductive life so it, it like it, before uh, beyond being ineffective imperialistic and cruel it contributes to the stigma. So even when it's had been repealed by a democratic government, we see that it's really hard to change the entire mech, uh, kind, kind of like bureaucracy to suddenly be more progressive. And at the end, even if it's changed, we stay kind of in the middle. So that's why it's so important to repeal it once for all and stop this kind of a cruel game between parties, between repealing and imposing, repealing and imposing, where like at the end, are women in the field and the most vulnerable women who are affected by this uh, by this policy? It's a very cruel game. Yeah, 
Thanks, Maria Antonieta. And um, absolutely, the cruelty of it, um, you know, cannot be underestimated. And I think for change, um, you know, with Trump being elected, just as soon as he was elected, and Pence, Mike Pence being his vice president, um, we knew, we knew right away that the global gag rule, of course, is going to come back. But we did suspect that it was going to be even worse, and and it and it was. They expanded it to across all global health, um, whereas previous iterations only applied to international family planning. So, um, for change, we, our work was um, greatly impacted, obviously, from this uh, from the expansion. Um, immediately, we created new two new mechanisms. We had a, a, a legal working group that we put together of lawyers and council at different at advocacy and the implementing organization groups to really explore strategies for um, legal strategies to mitigate harm. Um, so like while we were fighting to like trying to, we wanted it repealed, but that's an act of Congress, as long as it was in place, we needed to find ways and think creatively through the law on how to really um, to, to grapple with the, the expanded policy and to mitigate the harm um, in real time over the past four years. And similarly, we brought together um, researchers into a global gag rule research group because we also knew that, well, everybody, we need to document, and you know, starting on day one, what is the impact? Um, and then, but we also wanted to make sure that uh, we were coordinating sharing methodologies, but also that we didn't want all of a sudden all these, every, everybody doing research going to Kenya or to Uganda and needs to make sure geographically we spread out one to, to get better research and data, but also we didn't want to inundate the groups on the ground who are already dealing with this hor horrible policy and then on top of it um, to be, um, meeting, you know, responding to all these research requests. So um, those were two ways we really had to organize ourselves differently that we've never done before. Um, but most importantly, um, as Maria Antonieta was talking about, it's the, the impact on the people's lives on our partners. Um, and in, and I'll give a few example, additional examples. Um, in 2018, one PEPFAR partner in Iswatini had to close all of the voluntary medical male circumcision services in its district. Um, the facility had provided 42% of the district's um, voluntary male circumcision services in 2017. So those were completely wiped out because of the global gag rule. Um, it shuttered successful PEPFAR HIV prevention programming, ended advocacy relationships because groups who were taking US funding felt like they couldn't work with those who weren't taking US funding that were working on abortion. People lost their jobs. Um, people, clinics had to fire people. Um, they had to end um, youth employment and, and youth outreach programs, um, a reduction of cancer screenings, gender-based violence services, um, and dis it disproportionately impacts LGBTQI communities um, because they get a lot of their services from reproductive health family planning clinics are also serving LGBTQI communities. Um, and then also we saw um, also people with disabilities um, being impacted. So the people, I mean, and just want to stress, you know, that the, the people on the ground were really impacted in, um, in ways that, you know, we document some, but it's just so much more. And I know um, Guttmacher has done really in-depth research on this as well. And it's devastating. And I think that's why it's so important that it just has to end completely once and for all. No, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, we've done a lot of research and documented impacts on at least five levels, and I'll, I'll put a link in the chat here. Um, and the five levels being impacts on people seeking care that we've just heard about, impacts on healthcare providers, impacts on implementing partners, uh, impacts on public health systems, so with fewer community health workers being able to go out and provide door-to-door -door services, and then impacts on foreign policy and how this has undermined the U.S.'s standing overseas and relationships with other organizations. Um, and Stacey, you asked a question about how long it'll take to undo these harms. And I've heard some people talk about the gag rule as a, as a light switch that flips on and off. And I, I don't think that's a very good analogy. I think it's much more accurate to call it a really slow, inefficient dimmer switch. So yes, you can bring the light back, but it's gonna be slow and there's always gonna be kind of a shadow looming. 
So the point is that it's going to take years to get partners back into the fold, to rebuild capacity, to get patients and providers to trust each other again and trust the U.S. government, and to get other countries to truly believe in us. But as Sarah said, frankly, none of that is going to happen 100% until the global gag rule is gone for good. So that leads, all of that leads really um, closely into my next question, which is, you know, we saw from the study in The Lancet recently, and I'll go ahead and explain that for the people who are watching who aren't familiar with the study from The Lancet that we all know so well. Um, there was a study from The Lancet that looked at the effects of the global gag rule, the previous version during the Bush administration years, which was a less expansive version uh, than the one we saw under the previous administration. And they found that for the 10 sub-Saharan African countries most impacted by the gag rule, the ones who lost the most US support, their abortion rates actually increased by 40% during that time period. Uh, and so the rates of, of um, maternal injuries, the rates of unsafe abortions, the rates of all, all of those sort of negative impacts. So, given that it takes so much time to do that sort of wide in-depth analysis, I mean, how long do you think it will actually be before we know the true impact of the, the most recent expanded version of the global gag rule? And what do you think a study like that, Lancet, you know, I mean, I, I understand that that's um, uh, asking you to sort of project, but you know, given your expertise and, and what we saw under that earlier version, what, what do you think that a similar study would show? I'll, I'll get us started. Um, I mean, I think a similar Lancet study would involve exploring the impact of the policy on more than just contraception and abortion. An updated study would most likely include impact on a range of SRHR, sexual reproductive health and rights issues, especially around HIV and LGBTQI people. I think there's a lot more data that we need on that. Um, and I will send, I'll find the link to a fact sheet that changes put together with that lists um, the various impacts that we have um, to date. But I think it's important to recognize also how hard civil society and other donors work together to mitigate the harm of the policy um, that most publicized is the She Decides, which successfully, successfully stepped in for some larger organizations in some regions, specifically around family planning access, contraception access. But activists and advocates also work tirelessly uh, to try to share information and reduce the harm of the policy at a scale not seen before. Um, so, and so that, that means like just making sure that people understand where it applies or not applies, the, the confusion between homes and global gag rule, um, but also where are some workarounds? I mean, the global gag rule does have exceptions for rape, incest, and life endangerment, but a lot of people get on the, in countries receiving funding don't realize that and think they can't not do anything related to abortion. So that's what I mean by mitigating harm is, is helping people. You have this policy, but what are the workarounds? Um, so we have and we'll have more data on the harms, but it needs to be understood in this context of harm mitigation. Um, and also useful to remember how, how, wild, how wild this conversation is right now, talking about the harms and focusing on the harms. No one, including three different US government reports, allege that any good health comes come out of this policy. We're only ever talking about the scope of the harm that the policy causes. We don't talk about any good that comes out of it. Yeah, and Sarah, just to add to that, you know that the State Department must have tried to find something good to say and they couldn't even find something good. All they could say is that the policy did harm to HIV programs, tuberculosis programs, nutrition, water and sanitation. The Trump administration's own State Department had to confess that publicly, which tells you just how bad it is. And I really wanna underscore a point that Sarah made that there's been absolutely no documentation of a single benefit, a single public health benefit, political benefit perhaps, but no public health benefit to anybody from this policy in any iteration. And to your question, Stacey, the Trump administration expanded the global gag rule not once, but twice, and tried to do it a third time on the way out the door. So we know if the baseline was bad, that this vast expansion is going to be much, much worse. 
Yeah, and I think like, I mean, just to add on that, I, I, what I was saying before, it, like, I mean, this policy is really ineffective. I mean, it doesn't produce any good. Even for people who have in their heart the anti-choice agenda, they were not able to prove that actually reduce the need for abortion. It's just make it like harder and unsafe for women. And and I think that like the, I mean, like the Trump administration's implementation of the policy was like kind of like this global gag rule on asteroids, like really like growing in every direction. And it's going to be hard also. I think that like we saw the report on the Lancet and, and, and we, I mean, I mean, we were not surprised because we saw it, but like you can really tell the impact that like we can multiply that for 10 for the global gag rule under the Trump administration and things that we may not even know. Like, I mean, we 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 work very closely and like on, on on a case, for example, like where like um Pro Familia Colombia, like an organization that provides comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services in Colombia, including abortion, uh, because in Colombia abortion is legal. Uh, and they were about to sign an agreement with USAID to provide a basic services to immigrants from Venezuela, like, I mean, people coming from Venezuela to Colombia on their, I mean, humanitarian assistance settings, and they were not able to start that work because the Trump administration came in power and they had the global gag rule. And so I think that the expand in terms of like, this was migration, humanitarian uh, services that were not even Stutter. So I think that like the impact will be huge between what Sarah and Sarah were saying in terms of the program that has to be shot, the services that were not provided, but also it was expanded. So everything frozen, even things that were really fundamental, like working on humanitarian settings on basic healthcare service. So I think, yeah, like, I don't know, four years or eight years from now, we will, when we see that report, I mean, like we will see the, the, the scope. And I think that that's why it's also important that the Biden-Harris administration sent a very strong message to all the, the I mean, the new SAID machinery saying, this is a message. We need to speed up the recovery from, from, these, from these times. So let's go back and talk a little bit more. Zara, you mentioned the shadow from, from the dimmer switch. So let's talk a little bit more about why we need to pass the Global HER Act and, and why and how that the risk of the policy coming back, how that inhibits progress and, and what that does to clinics. So, so why is that such a problem? But a little more detail about that, please. Sure. So when it's in place, the gag rule puts providers in an impossible position. Agree to these ideological terms or forgo the money. But when the gag is not in place, it also puts providers in a bind. Agree to come back into the US fold and undo everything you just did and know that it's all gonna be for nothing in a few years or stay away and try and scape, scrape together resources. And this is why the gag is so incredibly insidious. Even when it's not actually in place, it still manages to cast this enormous cold dark shadow. And frankly, that makes it untenable because the longer this goes on and the more aggressive the gag rule becomes, the more providers and partners are gonna stay away and the more people who are gonna lose access to essential life-saving services. And so that's why we need the Global Her, Global Her Act so that the gag can't keep casting this shadow and haunting providers even when it's officially not in place. Yeah, I think I'll just, you know, to add to that, I think the, the other piece of this is we have organizations that have just stopped trying to get US funding um, and a lot of feminist women's rights organizations. And so it has that lingering. So it's really pulled, you know, needed resources from organizations doing critical work overseas. And so it's, so I think these, these kinds of policies that are, um, as Maria said, and, you know, neo-colonial, they're, they're racist and they really are um, preventing organizations from doing 
the work that they need to do. And so it either, you know, shuts down organizations or limits their resources because organizations can't, you know, they can't afford just, it's an ethical issue, right? Um, don't take money and to, if you can't do what your mission is, your, you know, what your organization is or follow your beliefs and principles. And that's why it's just, it is insidious. And, um, and so I think that's, that's an important piece to really, it's not just about, it's not just the public health aspects of it, which are absolutely critical in terms of life-saving, but in terms of how we're really preventing people from, and organizations and countries from living there by their conscience and, um, and doing what's best and responding to the, the, their country's um, challenges with local um, solutions. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, um, I think that when you f when when you think about like this, as I said, that this cruel game between kind of imposing and repealing the gag rule. I mean, what we see, it's like kind of a bunch of people well, like signing a document and say, okay, it's repeal now. Okay, it's imposed again. But kind of what Sarah was saying, kind of this impact, like build again the services that are needed like Sarah was like talking about these services that were like shut down building that again training the people hiring the people getting the trust of a community it takes years so it's not something I like I really like the like I mean this it's not like on and off it takes years so so it's it really this game between should I I mean, like, should I take money from the U.S. knowing that depending on what happens, maybe in four years, suddenly all this investment, like I will have suddenly to shut down. It's completely inefficient. And it's, as I said, like it's, it doesn't help anyone. So I, I really um, think it is so important, like that the Global Hero Act is passed and to finish this game once for all. And that actually prevents and, 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 and remove this tool because it is a political tool. It's not a technical tool. It has nothing to do with the actual uh, issue of abortion because abortion, again, like the need will be is still there. So it's just a political, it's a, it's a bone that is thrown to a, to a constituency. So remove that bone and remove that tool once for all. And if they want to play with some other political game that at least those women in the field are not the ones suffering for this cruel game that it's that it's play in Washington. So I think that like really the Global Care Act is fundamental uh, to to um, promote an ethical approach and an approach that is less um, neocolonialist, like of coming from the from the U.S. So we we're watching. So I see a question in the chat. Uh, it's a good question to ask here. So someone wants to know if the gag rule results in a big bucket of unspent funds or, or where does that money end up going? Does it end up going to less effective programs or, or worse organizations? Um, how, does, how does that work when, when the sort of top providers back out? Um, it's a it's a good question. I think uh, Sarah, I'm looking at you too. I, largely, the answer is no. There it's um, there might be some delays in diverting to, as you said, less efficient partners. But um, in some ways, the money just gets tied up in um, less impactful programs. That's that's exactly right, and that's that's part of the problem. And that's actually why some organizations they really grapple with ethically, morally, they're opposed to it. Um, but they'll take the US money because they don't want it going to organizations that are not qualified, who are actually gonna be working against women's uh, and people's uh, reproductive health access. Um, so it really creates those, um, you know, those dilemmas and, and just kind of those, the, the ethical dilemmas that so many groups are put in. But um, yeah, as Sarah said, it's, it's a matter of, um, it goes to either less qualified organizations or organizations take it and hold their nose. So once we've actually passed the Global Her Act, we're still gonna have the Helms Amendment in place. So there's this whole, there are layers to this fight. So what, let's talk a little bit specifically about the Helms Amendment and how it works and what the impacts are more broadly sort of beyond the gag rule. 
Sure. So I can kick us off with this. So first of all, it's really important to understand the difference between the two, since they're often talked about like the same thing. They're not. The gag rule is about telling people what they can't do with their own money. The Helms Amendment tells people what they can't do with U.S. money, which is namely to support safe abortion services. So this Helms Amendment is a draconian policy. It applies even in countries where abortion is legal. So as Maria Antoinette was saying before, it's forcing the U.S. to undermine local health systems, national sovereignty, and meddles in what is a legal health service. And so the failure of the U.S. to support safe abortion contributes to more than 35 million unsafe abortions every year in low and middle income countries, and those lead to 23,000 preventable maternal deaths. So a couple of weeks ago, we released a new analysis, and I'll put it in the chat, that shows the impact of the Helms Amendment if it were to be repealed and if the U.S. supported uh, safe abortion services in the 33 countries where abortion is already legal and where the U.S. is supporting family planning programs. So we found that there would be 19 million fewer unsafe abortions each year, 17,000 fewer maternal deaths each year. The overall number of maternal deaths due to abortion would decline by 98%. There would be 12 million fewer women each year who have abortion related complications. And then there'd be a cost savings of $641 million. So this is probably an underestimate. This just looks at a few countries, 33 countries. And even if more countries liberalize their abortion laws or USAID expands their work, the even more people and communities and countries would benefit. So there's a huge upside to repealing the Helms Amendment as well. I just want to add to that, you know, in at the 1994 International Conference on Population Development where the US joined 170 countries and into this agenda. And while the agenda didn't go far enough on abortion, it did say that where abortion is legal, um, that countries should make it available, safe, um, accessible. And so the US government signed that and joined that consensus. And I think it's it's forgotten um, largely and, and that they committed to, to supporting countries who's, who were liberalizing their laws where it was legal. Um, so there's really, um, to have this, this law um, goes directly against that, um, that commitment. And, and so I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a need to really call into account um, the US government on this policy that is, um, again, I'm gonna say it again, because it it's neo-colonial, it's racist. And um, I think that, that we have the audacity to go into these countries and tell them that they can't be implementing their own existing laws or we're not gonna help them. And not only not, we're not gonna help them, we're going to actually inhibit their ability um, to provide these services and to that th these are countries responding to their, their local public health challenges and the US government is just standing in the way and it's really, it's egregious. Absolutely, and I, and I think that like um, the, Kind of one of the the, the big challenges uh, of and why it is so important to to repeal the Helms Amendment is because it, I mean, reproductive health is comprehensive. You need to have a comprehensive approach when you have a, when when you provide services and when you have a policy, and kind of preventing organization and governments from having these comprehensive approach because they need the resources, but they cannot use the resources where they know is needed. And here we're talking, I mean, like, again, like many times we, we think about this as in paper, but we're th thinking, I mean, like talking about working humanitarian settings when we know that many of these women sadly has been has suffered from sexual violence and maybe face it uh, facing an unwanted pregnancy and that they need as part of the uh, basic health care services to have access to abortion and organizations working on 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 humanitarian healthcare settings having to struggle and kind of uh, um, kind of deal with how to be able to provide these without uh, pissing off the U.S. that has this policy that actually uh, kind of have, have this broad interpretation when like, I mean, like the, the actual text doesn't necessarily, of the, of, of the Helms Amendment doesn't necessarily say that, but like has this overall interpretation that no money 
coming from the US should ever be used on a portion. And, and it, it really, again, it's creating no good, but it's creating a lot of harm. So I think that that's why the abortion is healthcare everywhere act is so important. And and I was like a like a representative woman Jakowski was talking about like I really like that it has the word abortion there in the title of the of the bill because it is important that we that we that that we do our best to to reduce the stigma around abortion and every time that we kind of shy away and not mention abortion we're doing that so I think it is important that this pass again like to repeal the global gap rule once for all, but then also to go to the root with the Helms Amendment to ensure that actually the U.S. can provide, can, can implement a comprehensive foreign policy, a really comprehensive on sexual and reproductive health and rights. So um, how, do we, how do we work together as a global community to get rid of these current policies and prevent others from being imposed? What, what can we do as a global society? Well, I think that it, it is important to call it out. I think that it, like all the campaigns, the research that is being done, like sadly, I mean, we, we live in a very polarized world and we are seeing like, I mean, we have like the Bolsonaro's in, in Brazil and we, I mean, we are seeing these type of governments who have a very regressive policies, who are very uh, were like populist and trying to be closer to these, uh, to the anti-choice movement, not only in the US, everywhere. And it is, uh, it is very important to work together organizations. I mean, like the organizations that we're here now, Change, Goodmaker, IPAS, that we are, we work on the same field, but we complement each other in terms of research, advocacy, service provision, technical work. We need to tackle these from every angle. I think that it is very important to support the, the, the mobilization, the movement. I mean, we just saw it in Argentina how, I mean, a very vibrant a women's movement, very young, took the streets and changed the law. Uh, they, they were defeated two years ago in the Congress, and then they took that like sadness and frustration from the defeat and like bring it again. And it, it, is, it is very important when we, I mean, we, when we talk about the GAC rules and the Kelms Amendment, the, kind of the center of the conversation is service provision. What I mean, because that's th these regulations are about abortion service provision, but we need to have a comprehensive view when it comes to, to abortion, because service provision, it's one element. If we put in the center that woman that is facing an unwanted pregnancy, and we look at all the elements that facilitate her decision to terminate that pregnancy or that obstruct the possibility of make that decision the the kind of the availability of the services is one component but you also have as i've been saying stigma the stigma is huge and many women do not access services do not seek for services because stigma there's like the community support there is of course the law the regulation so i think that one element that it is important that we work in as a community is to be able to look at this issue from a, a, like what we call at IPAS, like an ecosystemic view, like a comprehensive view. And we are able to invest in all the areas. And, and we hope that from the US government and the, the philanthropy more and more to look at, at this comprehensive view and to be able to invest in service, but also invest, for example, in women's organization in the field that were from what we're seeing in Latin America, but also in Poland, in other countries are the ones holding the ground when it comes to, to reproductive justice. Um. Yeah, and I think it's it's great. And I think following up Maria Antonieta said about, you know, centering the people who are impacted. And I think when we're working in the US, when we're working on these kinds of policies that impact people overseas, people who are in countries that are impacted, really centering them. And I think there's a there's a wonderful saying from the sex worker rights movement, nothing about us without us. 
And I think we really need to take that to heart. And I think it can help us be bolder as US advocates. And I think taking those um, the, the voices, the experiences um, to members of Congress um, to really, I think the data and the evidence is really important, but kind of gets to their, you know, you have to get to their hearts and their minds. We get to their minds with the data and evidence, and we get to their heart by really hearing firsthand accounts of, of what the U.S. government, the impact that we're having on people's lives. Um, I think another um, piece is to connect U.S. policies and U.S. foreign policies. Um, these are very much separated. There's a false division, and I think we need to be better in the United States about making the connections. I think I think the Biden Harris administration, as I said when I opened, that they've already put it's you. It's the policy of this administration to support sexual reproductive health and rights in the U.S. and globally. So how can we, as advocates, as um, as voters, as organizations uh, really align our agendas, I think we'll be so much stronger. I think for so long, um, it's been conventional wisdom that foreign policy is not a voting issue in the United States. And it's like, yes, that's not gonna be how people vote, but it doesn't mean that voters don't care about it. And that's why I love so much that Population Connection has been doing this work in out um, across the country, really educating voters about these issues because we need your voices. Um, we can't, there's only a few of us in Washington that are actually doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, we need that that kind of, that mobilization. And I think the and it's, it's movement building, right? That's what this is all about. Um, and I think as much as we can align with movements around racial justice, climate change, women's rights, sex worker rights that, you know, in the US and globally, if we can really bring these movements together, um, again, I think we, it can be really powerful to um, make these kinds of policies like Helms and the global gag rule, um, that it's just that people won't stand for it and that the US policymakers um, need to really hear that. Uh, Zara, did you have anything to add? Okay, <laughs> handled. <laughs> so what are your organizations doing to reassure partners whose confidence has to have been shaken by the last few years? Um, so, you know, how, how do we, how do we reassure them that, that we've got their backs, that we're, that we're trying to fix this? I, you know, I, I that it's, it's hard to answer that when we just had an, a coup attempt in our capital and seriously, our democracy is so fragile. Um, it's, we're not good, we're not the best, you know, it's like telling, reassuring our global partners is not possible. Um, what we can assure them of is that there are people in the United States who have their back, that we're fighting for them, that we really, um, we're going to be here through and through um, to really, to put out the fires in Washington um, and, and to be supportive of them there in the country. I mean, and so I think that, you know, this is, this is why this time is so important over this year um, is our moment to get rid of this once and for all. And I think our global partners are really counting on us to do that. Um, and so it's really about, I think if we can follow through on the, our advocacy and have some successes here in Washington, I think that's how we reassure them that they have people in the United States who have their back. Yeah, no, like I, I agree with Sarah and, and being like someone, um living uh, overseas and 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 looking at what happened um, in in the US from well, from the, the neighbor in the south from Mexico but like I mean like in IPAS most of our work is is overseas I think that there's there's a lot of concerns uh, about uh, the situation in the in the in the US and what happened I mean really the 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 four years, and I know, like I mean, like from inside, uh, I'm having lived in the U.S. for for a long time. Uh, from inside, like these four years of the Trump administrations were like very challenging to say in yeah, say in a way. Uh, but like from the from the outside, I was it was really scared. It was really scared to see how quickly things could change 
and how bad in terms of in terms of uh, the impact that it had. I mean, not only in our agenda, but if you see climate change, if you see migration, like almost like like on every agenda, every progressive agenda, you could you could see like this this impact. So I think that right now, it, what we are what we are doing is like I mean like with our with our partners, like like saying that we are working closely with the government, like trying to to be closely to the governments to provide this vision from what is happening. I mean, there are so many needs in the U.S. and that like there the situation was so critical that that like it's really hard to to look outside, but like I'm kind of bringing what is happening outside, bringing the reality of what is happening in other countries and 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 and, and bring it closer to the government. And that's why I think that uh, the abortion is healthcare everywhere act is so important in terms of like, it's not only about what is happening in the US, but it's also about the impact of the US and how the US is a key player outside. So what we're, what we're telling to our partners is like that, this is a time to bring these voices like to that that we need to work together to to well to help this administration to be successful because that would be in the benefit of everyone i agree with everything everybody just said and, and the only thing i would add is that in some ways this is like a relay race right you get exhausted if you try and run the entire thing by yourself we are all going to burn out at some point so this is also about showing compassion to other partners and saying we know you have suffered under the Trump administration. Like I will take up the mantle and push for change now. Um, you were playing defense for so long. Let me play offense a little bit now. So I think that that is also about partnership and why we're all here tonight is about how we we pivot and pick up some of that slack now. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, it looks like we have about eight minutes left. So I'm gonna skip to my last question so that we have a couple of minutes for questions from the chat. What are one or two things that you would suggest that our advocates should emphasize during their Hill meetings in making the case for the Global HER Act, for substantial U.S. investment in family planning, and for support of UNFPA? Sure. So I would say on the substance, be clear that these investments have a tangible impact on lives saved and healthcare costs saved, but they also have benefits in terms of gender equity, economic development, political stability. And so, yes, these investments are the right thing to do, but they're also the smart thing to do. And on the style side, don't be afraid to be passionate and personal. Anyone can recite talking points and stats, but be clear about why you care, why this matters to you as a person. And you will be more powerful and persuasive than any paid lobbyist when you allow your passion and your commitment to shine through. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and I think just on a, you know, when you're meeting with your representatives, your senators, I think, you know, obviously we want them to support this effort. We want them to sign on to the bill, et cetera. But we also need leadership. That means um, Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi and Schumer, that we need their leadership on this. So at the end of the day, when, when deals are being cut behind closed doors, um, we need them to have our backs. So I think encouraging your members that telling them that we need leadership to support ending this bill, because if it's not the bill, it may be, we may get rid of it through another um, mechanism, which is fine. But um, again, I just can't stress that enough. Um, and then also just, um, you know, ending the policy, how it's good in terms of letting countries respond to their own public health um, challenges with their own local, local solutions. And the US government should get out of the way of, of countries, of other governments um, doing what they think is, is, is best for their country when it comes to making abortion legal and accessible. Yeah, and I, I mean, if I can add something, like, and I fully agree with, with Sarah and with Sarah, like in terms of like a, a um, how to approach and, and then like this idea, I like, really like what, what Sarah said in terms of like, allow yourself to be passionate about this and like, to, like talk to your, I mean, with your crew boys. Um, and I mean, show them that this has impact on real people, that these policies like, I mean, are like, a, like really real people 
uh, many miles away, many times from Washington, it's suffering with these policies. And this time, the type of leadership that is needed, like from the U.S., is a leadership that brings people together, that brings country together. We, uh, uh, we know in this in this field and in every field, and and there is no way to bring countries together and to create that partnership and support that the world needs. Uh, if you are uh, keep if you keep imposing these imperialistic and colonialistic that are it's like it's my way and my the way that I see it is the only way possible that it is important that all U.S. policies respect the realities and the needs of of local people and and I and I think that like bring some some statistics but also bring some some stories like about uh, the information that you also know from your community of what happened when women can um, when women have access to contraceptives when women can decide on whether to continue or not a pregnancy i mean our agenda it's about it's about motherhood it's to ensure that no one is forced into motherhood that motherhood is always a, it's something that is positive for women so i think that it's also like i mean that talk about your values and your principles and what guides uh, your 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 own agenda so and and thank you and thank you from overseas for doing this work like we really need people like you talking to your representatives with the voices of we the ones who are affected by by these policies so thank you very much for for doing this work thank you for that so i've got a few questions here just really quickly from the chat um, a couple of technical questions. Um, somebody wants to know what's the difference between the Helms and the Hyde Amendment because Congresswoman Schakowsky mentioned them both. And then what are the biggest gaps in reproductive health funding right now? Yeah, so I'll take really quickly the Helms Hyde one. It's confusing. Uh, the Helms Amendment applies to US foreign assistance funding overseas not being able to be used for abortion. The Hyde Amendment applies domestically, and it says U.S. funding cannot be used to support abortion domestically. I'll just say, I have a pinned tweet. I get this question like 15 times a day. My pinned tweet is about the difference between the gag rules, Helms, and Hyde. So, um, yeah. And in terms of your second question, in terms of the gaps on, on, on reproductive health, I think, I, like, challenging like a uh, many uh, i mean we don't have sufficient funding even for the basic when you would think about reproductive health like access to family planning and i mean we still need funding for family planning but abortion is one of the areas that is like because it's so controversial and i think that like again there is a reason to make it controversial with when actually it's just healthcare it's a service uh, but there's very few uh, funding for um, for abortion services for abortion supplies so there is a huge need in, in that area all right so um, I, we've got one minute left according to the clock on my computer. So I wanna give you all the opportunity to it, like any final statements, anything I should have asked, but didn't. Uh, what do you wanna leave our audience with tonight? No one, we covered everything. Um, I will just say, thank you. Um, you're doing the hardest thing, which is to show up at the end of a long day to listen to people talk at you uh, about something that they're nerding out about. And <laughs> you have stuck with it, all 63 of you. I see you. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate you because, as I said, we cannot do this alone. This is not something that is like a one and done, one meeting, you've got your win. This is a long sustained campaign and we need every single person. And you may not feel like you're contributing a lot. You do this a few times a year, but it actually means a lot that regular people take the time to show up and, and advocate on this issue, that it's not a niche thing. So I just wanna say how much I appreciate each and every one of you from across the country and across, across the globe. Yeah, I would just add my voice to that as I said like thank you for for doing this and 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 I mean I think that we 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 cover like everything and 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 for me it's like the, the most important is like a 
but it's abortion is healthcare at the end. I mean, at the end, and like the more we do like to reduce stigma on abortion, the most we talked about it, we have a program in IPAS with other organizations where like we have a site for women to share their own stories to we, I think that many times we think that abortion is like a, a service that a few women need because there are so few of us talking about this. But the moment that you start asking your grandmother, your sister, your aunt, your friend, we see that there are a lot of women who, who have the, the need for these services. So this is more regular than we when that we think and talking about this. And again, thank you because you are, I mean, like we need the US to take this work and you are the ones who are actually making it happen with your like actions every day and with this type of work. So um, you have an, you have allies all over the world. And as I said before, we are watching, the entire world is watching and we are expecting uh, great things of the Biden-Harris administration and of this new government. Yeah, just just adding my thanks. And um, and I think just two things. I think one would be, you know, to um, you know, we really need to break down this false divide between US domestic and US global policy. And I think the more that we can all be talking about it, making those linkages um, for ourselves, for the policymakers, because for too long, I mean, it's the same people making decisions and policies about US domestic policy as it is for foreign policy around abortion, around sexual reproductive rights. So I think it really calling the Biden administration to account, what do they mean by in the US and globally? So. Um, I think we can make a lot of um, progress if we bring these two uh, agendas together. Um, and similarly, you know, the intersectionality of these issues. I think with the one thing that we've learned about the expansion of the global gag rule is it's really, it's just so blatant how these um, sexual reproductive health and rights issues are interconnected and how they come into people's lives. So we can no longer separate abortion and HIV and contraception and maternal health, that these are all in, people are dealing with these things um, as single individuals. So um, so I think that's important. So I just, I'm again, thank you to Population Connection for doing this, for bringing you all together. Um, it's just, it's so inspiring and gives me so much hope and not feeling like we're all alone doing this. Um, we need you. And so we're really grateful for, for you all stepping up and stepping into this work. Well, thank you all to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, everybody in the chat, please join me in uh, a little round of applause for our panelists for coming tonight. This was a great discussion. Uh, we really, really appreciate you being here. Uh, and to the supporters watching, I just wanna say thank you to all of our activists and donors for making this whole program possible. Um, this work wouldn't be possible without your support and dedication. And if you are willing and able to donate to our campaign or would like to get involved in other ways, please do reach out. We're gonna drop some links in the chat.